The consequences of chronic liver disease can be figured out by first of all thinking about what the liver actually does. So I'm going to list a few of the key functions of the liver on the left hand side and on the right hand side you'll see the consequences um, that arise when those functions are no longer uh, fulfilled. So one of the key functions of the liver is to produce albumin which in turn is important for hormone transport and also to maintain the plasma oncotic pressure such that we can um, establish an effective circulating volume. So if we don't produce enough albumin, we are unable to keep fluid within the intravascular compartment and hence we develop edema. The liver is also responsible for bilirubin metabolism and obviously a defect in bilirubin metabolism will lead to jaundice. If the liver is unable to make clotting factors, it can lead to coagulopathy and excessive bleeding. And finally, the liver detoxifies all of the uh, various toxins that are absorbed within our GI tract. So if it's unable to do that, it means that lots of these nitrogenous toxins will get through to the systemic circulation and can cause encephalopathy. As for causes, there are a few very common causes and they include alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and viral hepatitis. So the consequences of chronic liver disease can be better understood if we have a decent understanding of the anatomy in that region. So we have our gastrointestinal tract within the red box here and that is drained via the hepatic portal vein into the liver. And so the liver is the first organ that is met by quite a lot of the substances that we ingest. So it'll travel via the hepatic portal vein to the liver, which detoxifies the blood and returns the cleaned blood into the systemic circulation. So in patients with chronic liver disease, uh, repeated bouts of damaging the liver, whether it's due to a virus or alcohol or fat, um, it leads to generation of lots of little nodules within the liver. And this means that blood is unable to get through the liver into the systemic circulation quite as easily as it would have done before. And hence this means that there's quite a lot of back pressure into the portal system. In order to reduce the pressure on the portal system, blood gets shunted towards sites of portosystemic anastomosis. And there are three main sites that are important to remember. First of all, we have esophageal varices, which are very important to note because patients with esophageal varices can suffer from massive GI bleeds which can be fatal. Caput medusae is another common exam uh, sign that comes up all the time and it refers to dilated veins around the umbilicus and finally rectal varices as well. So those are the three main sites of portosystemic anastomosis that get um, dilated and can bleed in patients with chronic liver disease. One other sign that's worth mentioning is that the hepatic portal vein also has a branch which goes to the spleen. So when blood backlogs into the portal circulation, patients will also get splenomegaly. So I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the fluid balance issues in patients with chronic liver disease. So this is the diagram of the various forces at play under normal conditions. So within a capillary, we'll have a little bit of hydrostatic pressure which pushes fluid into the interstitium. And then there's two places that the fluid can go. So first of all, quite a lot of it will return back into the blood vessels because the albumin within the blood vessel exerts uh, an oncotic pressure that tries to draw water back in to the intravascular compartments. Any residual fluid that is left within the interstitium can get soaked up by the lymphatics and delivered back to our circulatory system. In patients with chronic liver disease, however, given that their liver is damaged and blood is not flowing through it quite as easily as it would be otherwise. I mentioned earlier that you get a lot of backlog of blood into the portal circulation and hence you get an increase in the hydrostatic pressure within the circulation. So this means that more fluid will be leaking out of the, uh, off the blood vessels into the interstitium. However, to compound matters further, the patients with chronic liver disease are no longer producing albumin quite as much as they would be before and hence the oncotic pressure has decreased. So given that hydrostatic pressure has increased, oncotic pressure has decreased, there is a net movement of fluid into the interstitium and it overwhelms the ability of the lymphatics to deal with it. And this is why patients with chronic liver disease end up uh, edematous. So chronic liver disease can be quite stable for quite a long time. However, certain insults such as drinking alcohol or infections can cause decompensation. 
So the term decompensation means that the liver has been doing just about enough to get by and carry out most of its normal functions. However, some sort of insult has meant that it is failing to carry out its functions once again. So as a result of this, patients do develop ascites. So that's a common presentation of decompensated chronic liver disease. And there are a few key investigations that help us manage a patient with ascites. So from a diagnostic point of view, the serum ascites albumin gradient is really useful to try and figure out what exactly is causing the societies. And when it comes to serum ascites albumin gradient, there's a cutoff value of 11.1 grams per litre. So if the value is less than 11.1 grams per litre, it generally suggests that it's an exudative cause, uh, such as uh, an infection or inflammation or malignancy. Um, the only caveat is that nephrotic syndrome can cause ascites and a low serum ascites albumin gradient without being an inflammatory exudative process. And the reason is that patients with nephrotic syndrome are peeing out their albumin and hence the serum albumin level will be quite low. If the serum ascites albumin gradient is greater than 11.1 grams per litre, that is more suggestive of a transudative cause such as renal failure or heart failure. Another parameter that we're interested in is the neutrophil count. So if there are more than 250 neutrophils per millimeter cubed, that is suggestive of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is an infection of the acidic fluid. And this needs to be managed promptly because patients can become very unwell very quickly. And it's generally managed using either tazosin or a third generation cephalosporin. So the management of ascites usually requires the insertion of an acidic drain to remove all of this excess fluid. But there's a couple of complications that are worth being aware of. So first of all, we have something called postparacentesis circulatory dysfunction, in which uh, the removal of a large volume of ascites can lead to certain hemodynamic shifts, which lead to the patient dropping their blood pressure. So to prevent this from happening, if an acidic drain is expected to drain more than 5 litres, Human albumin solution should be given at a rate of 8 grams per litre drained. The other aspect of managing ascites is to prevent reaccumulation. So the main diuretic that we use to reduce the accumulation of fluid in patients with decompensated chronic liver disease is spironolactone. And as a second line, we can use furosemide. A couple of other consequences of decompensated chronic liver disease include hepatic encephalopathy, where... Uh, the liver is no longer detoxifying various things that we absorb within our GI tract, and hence it gets into the systemic circulation and starts affecting our brain. So the mainstay of managing hepatic encephalopathy includes ensuring that the patients are opening their bowels regularly, and also using certain drugs that can modify our gut microbiome, such as rifaximin. And finally, coagulopathy is managed by uh, giving vitamin K in the short term, and an OGD is also an important investigation to be able to identify varices and uh, deal with them as required. Music